Channel Open. Welcome back to Weekly Trek, a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions Podcast Network and presented in partnership with TrekCore.com. I am your host, Alex Perry. What's today's date? The date. Today's show was recorded on June 18th, 2021, and is current through Star Trek Discovery Season 3, so beware of spoilers. All right, let's get into the show. Good day, Voyager, and welcome to A Briefing with Neelix. It's a catchy title, isn't it? Weekly Trek is a 30-minute news show covering the biggest stories from the Star Trek franchise. We are in a new golden age of Star Trek. There are multiple television shows in production, possibly more on the way, and enough merchandise to fill the Bajoran wormhole. So stick with me, and I'll help you sort the real facts from a lot of the Dominion propaganda that you'll find online. But I can't do this alone. And my guest this week is returning guest and co-host of the Snap Trek podcast. It's Ross Webster. Ross, welcome to Weekly Trek. Hello, sir. Thank you for having me back. A pleasure to be here. Well, it is my pleasure to have you. Well, Ross, you know the drill. I want to know something that's got you excited about Star Trek at the moment. What's got you moving at Warp 10? Oh, my God. I mean, there is absolutely so much to be excited about. And we're going to talk about loads of it, I know. But I'm going to stay really true to form and talk about what I'm looking forward to which is the upcoming finale and epilogue of the IDW comic series Star Trek Year 5, because the whole run has been absolutely phenomenal. And if a comic could be a TV show, this is it. It's captured the original series so perfectly. It's absolutely magnificent. And then beyond that, they're following up with a a mirror universe, mirror war set in the next generation era. I'm so excited for these comics and so excited that IDW is churning out the good stuff on a regular basis and that I'm here for it. So there's two for you. Two fantastic Star Trek comics. I am very behind with year five. What are some of the things you've been enjoying most about it? So I'm up to, I'm up to episode uh, issue 15. So I'm just about to get into the Harry Mud arc. So I'm I'm very much looking forward to that. And uh, I know I'm about to find out about what's happening to Gary Seven and get Gary Seven's origins. What they've done is, They've tied up so many, not loose threads from the original series, but they've brought the characters together, disparate characters from different episodes, into one coherent series and made the stories flow into one another. And they've given the series new characters. There's a an ongoing Tholian character who you sort of, you know, learn to learn to talk with, and he becomes like a, a mascot for the crew. It, it's it's just a really it's a really great way of saying this is a new series of the original series. We, we're, we're seeing what could have happened if they'd made this show. And it is just exceptionally good. That is terrific. Well, the thing I'm feeling good about this week is that we're doing an episode and I just did one a week ago. It's been, uh, <laughs> out, it's probably been like two months now. I've been bi-weekly because there hasn't quite been enough news to do a weekly episode, but this is the first week we've got a weekly episode and boy, do we have a weekly episode. And so the thing I'm feeling good about this week is news surprises, right? Like the unexpected news drop of a trailer or some information about a show which we were not expecting because it was not pre-scheduled. I love Star Trek Day and First Contact Day and San Diego Comic-Con and New York Comic-Con, but you sort of know that you're going to get some interesting stuff those days. It's the days when you're just, you know, la 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 about your life and all of a sudden, boom, there's a trailer for Star Trek Picard Season 2 right in... Well, it was it was Captain Picard Day. The most arbitrary of Captain Picard Days. I still can't figure <laughs> out why June the 16th is Captain Picard Day. It's not the birthday of of Jean-Luc Picard. It's not the day on which the Pegasus aired. I think at some point somebody (laughs) must have taken the star date from the captain's log at the start of the Pegasus and put it into one of those like sort of internet like star date translator things which are all junk and it popped out June the 16th and they went okay that that's Captain Picard Day. I just, I see that, I see the banner start trending on Twitter and it's like, oh, it must be Captain Picard Day. I mean, that's how probably how it works every year. Somebody just posts it and then we all follow suit. Yeah, right. Well, I, I'm going to try in like three months, I'm going to say it's Captain Picard Day again and see if we can get ourselves another trip. Do it. I think a nice September Captain Picard Day would be right up my street. <laughs> a bit cooler. <laughs> all right. Well, with that, let's turn to the week's top stories. There's a war going on and I'm a reporter. After showing us our first images of the main characters of Star Trek Prodigy at the Viacom CBS Investor presentation in February, and then following it up with a picture of animated Captain Janeway at First Contact Day in April, 
Viacom CBS have now provided character and cast details for the Prodigy crew, and it includes a few fun surprises. Ella Purnell will be playing Gwyn, a quote, 17-year-old member of the Vau Nakat species, a new race to Star Trek, who was raised on her father's bleak mining planet and grew up dreaming of exploring the stars. Brett Gray will be playing Dal, who, quote, fancies himself a maverick and holds strong onto his unwavering hope even in the toughest of times. Dal's species is unknown. Jason Mantzoukas, who has had high-profile roles in comedies like Brooklyn Nine-Nine, The Good Place, and The League, will be voicing 16-year-old Tellarite Jankum Pog, who, quote, loves a good argument and regardless of his own opinion, he'll always play devil's advocate for the sake of hearing all sides. Angus Imri will voice Zero, who is a Medusan. The Medusans are an energy-based life form whose species was introduced in the original series episode, Is There No Truth in Beauty? And because Medusans are a non-corporeal race and they're genderless and they're known to cause madness to any humanoid who would lay eyes on their natural form, Zero wears a containment suit to protect those around them. D. Bradley Baker best known to Star Wars fans as the voices of literally all the clone troopers in the various Star Wars animated series, including the currently airing Bad Bat show on Disney+, Plus, will voice Murph, who is, quote, an endearing, indestructible blob with curiously good timing and insatiable appetite for ship parts. And lastly, Riley Alazraki will voice the Brickar Rock Tuck, an unusually bright eight-year-old girl. While a bit shy, Rock doesn't hold back when it comes to her love of animals. And yes, if you are a Star Trek novel fan, your ears will be tingling. And yes, you did hear me correctly. Rock Tuck will be a Brickar, who got their start in Peter David's Star Trek novels, most famously in the form of the USS Excalibur's security chief, Zach Kebron, in the New Frontier series. Prodigy will be the first time the race has appeared on televised Star Trek. In addition to character details, we were also treated to our first look at some stills of the animation style for Prodigy, and it is mind-blowingly drop-dead gorgeous. Seriously, if you haven't seen the character stills released earlier this week, or the landscape stills released a few days ago, definitely seek those out. They will blow you away. If this show looks half as good in motion as it does in these stills, I think we're in for a real treat. Ross, what's your reaction to the character breakdown and our first look at the art for Star Trek Prodigy? There is so much here to be excited about. So if we start at the back, the art is next level. I mean, this could be a film. This this is cinematic art. It looks absolutely gorgeous. It's almost unbelievable to think this is representative of the series. It's so good. So I'm so excited to see this continue to grow and how this is going to actually, how it's going to look when it's all complete. I love that they've got a Brickar character. That just totally rocks. It's nice to see an established non-canon species cement their place in Star Trek lore. And it's, you know, proof if proof were needed that when we're searching for character inspiration, the Hagman brothers left no stone unturned. Yeah. A nice few rock puns there for you. (laughs) I'm glad you're bringing your A-game today, Ross. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Zero the Medusin. I thought it was the concept is just great. Nice to include a gender neutral character. That's that's very right now. We we need that kind of thing more and more in all TV shows. And I did tweet earlier on that Zero was also the name of a character who didn't seem fantastically different in the unproduced Final Frontier animation from the I think it was the late nineties or early two thousands. And it suddenly struck me that ah, a character called Zero wears a containment suit. I wonder if there was some if they because they hadn't announced that they hadn't had the uh, the character breakdowns or hadn't seen them and I thought oh, maybe maybe this is a tie and maybe they're linking back to that unproduced thing but no totally different just happens to be called zero very strange but brilliant and the familiar faces as well recognizable characters great we're getting some big names big names in Star Trek Jason Manzukas he's in everything yeah that was really surprising to me and I'm very much looking forward to see what he does with the role of being this Tellarite. And and, and I think my kind of initial reaction, and I tweeted this out too, was in addition to, you know, being really excited for the show, very much on board for it, 
and continue to be more and more invested the more we learn about it. It is funny how the more I think I'm about to get my hands around what this show is, they chuck another curveball at me that kind of completely shakes up my understanding of it, right? So like, yeah. take Jason Manzukas's character, right? Jankum Pog. Everybody thought, well, the show's set in the Delta Quadrant, right? We we know it's set in the Delta Quadrant because that's what they've told us. So he's got to be a Talaxian. Sort of has that Talaxian look to him. No, he's a Teller. Yeah. Right? Zero's a Medusan. Uh, Rocktack is a Brickar. These are all Alpha Quadrant races. Three Alpha Quadrant races. Right. Who for some reason are now in the Delta Quadrant. So like, why are they there? Right, like I think originally we we were sort of coming at this of oh it's set in the Delta Quadrant and it's going to be a group of Delta Quadrant races and then they're going to learn about the Federation and the Alpha Quadrant. But like no, it's like some of these characters come from the Alpha Quadrant. They should have a relationship with the Federation and yet they don't. Right, I mean and possibly part of that is just because they're kids. But the other part of that is that might be part of the mystery to unpack behind this show. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I still don't quite know what we're going to get, and I love that fact. I I love that I can't predict what it's going to be. I, I think it, it's. It's exciting because, first of all, it's exciting because it, even though it's a children's animation, the animation looks like it's it's just so phenomenal. I, I've really been blown away by how beautiful it looks. But then you're right to say the, the mystery aspect of it. We, I mean, the, we know there's ebb and flow between the Alpha Quadrant and the Delta Quadrant because we've had a whole series, a whole series set there for seven years, and they met half a dozen uh, Alpha <laughs> yeah, Quadrant right. species while they were there. Including a whole ship of Klingons. Precisely, precisely. And we know that these characters are going to find their own Federation starship. So there obviously is, is transport and, and movement between the quadrants. But how did it happen? How do they get there? How do they wind up together? And where are they going? I'm so excited that these are the mysteries we're trying to figure out because this is exactly the thing that is is great TV. These kind of these kind of storylines. And you know, obviously, it's a kids show, but like, I mean, I, I am in, interested and invested in the story as well. But I mean, just for the visual feast of it from. The images that we've seen, I, I I can't wait for us to get a trailer. I I want a trailer. I want to know when this show is coming out. Like I'm I'm ready to go. I I'm ready for Prodigy. I'm uh, you know I I don't care if it's not finished yet. I I want it now because uh, <laughs> everything we learned this week is when the show was announced. You know you sort of like well I don't really know what that is other than the fact that it's for kids. And then it was the Kate Mulgrew thing, and I was like okay I'm on board. And then it was the characters, and I was like okay this seems really interesting. And then you saw animated Janeway, and now it's just like okay. Okay, yeah, I'm on board. I'm all in. I'm ready. Give it to me. You've definitely, I've definitely heard you ramp up your levels of excitement. You know, as the months go by and we get a few more snippets of info, it's been clear on Wiggly Trek you are sort of getting more and more interested in what's going on. I think for me, I, I'm a guy, I do like to watch a lot of cartoons. I'm a big, I'm a big cartoon guy. So I sort of came in thinking, this would be fun. But I've sort of been blown away by how good it looks. Like this, this looks better than most cartoons I would watch. Yeah. And this is already more interesting than most cartoons I would watch. So I'm sort of, I was already pretty much looking forward to it. But it's, it's really moving up. And I'm thinking, oh, th th is this going to be as good as Lower Decks? Am I going to be as impressed by this as I was by that? I, I, I hope so. And is this going to be the vehicle through which you introduce your children to Star Trek? Potentially. I, I mean, I've, I have tried to get my eldest to watch some some Star Trek. He knows who the characters are. And, you know, he, I tried to get him to watch some some animated series. But it's not fast-paced enough, I think, for the for the children of today. Oh, boy, that's today. another statement. Yes. <laughs> but uh, I have tried. We watched an episode the other day. Uh, we were watching an episode. It was an early episode of Enterprise. Series one, episode two, to Paul and uh, a crew have beamed down and they're camping overnight. Oh, yes. Yeah. Strange New Worlds. Name the Strange New Worlds. There you go. And uh, I was just telling him who the characters were. And I said, oh, that's to Paul. She's in charge. He's like, but I thought Spock was in charge. I was like, <laughs> well, so, yes, Spock often is in charge, but not not right now. But I, it was too complicated to explain to us yeah, right, right, right. why Spock wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> well, if that was not enough news for one week, Viacom CBS also lined up a special surprise for, yes, as we were talking about the arbitrarily chosen Captain Picard Day, which was a couple of days ago on June 16th, and they provided us with a new trailer for Picard Season 2, featuring our first look at footage from the second season. Varys? Varys? Varys! What the hell is happening here? Excellent question, Jean-Luc. Oh dear, you're a bit older than I imagined. 
mon capitaine. How oh, I've missed you. Q. Welcome, my friend, to the very end of the road not taken. Time has been broken. We can save the future, and I will get us home together. <gasps> That trailer was totally awesome and it created so many more questions than it answered. We saw different Starfleet uniform types, badges and logos we've never seen before. We saw Q, imagine how thrilled I am. Seven of Nine waking up in a bedroom and finding she has no Borg implants and an ominous time is broken motif. In addition to the trailer, new poster art for Picard Season 2 was also released, showing a contemporary or near-future Los Angeles skyline with a large Starfleet Delta carved out of the city's highways, echoing the Season 1 poster that had the Delta made out of the vines of Chateau Picard. What role does modern Los Angeles play in this season? I have no idea, but I am excited to find out. Ross, what did you think of the Picard Season 2 trailer? Okay, so... Off the back of the Prodigy trailer, this was a massive treat because I wasn't expecting it. It, So it looks gorgeous and it has that sort of, there's no real information being given here. You're just getting a look. This is just a a, a taste and a mousse-bouche for what's going to come. But you get the impression that it's an alternate reality, which actually is is very clever because following the original adventure of, of our Picard crew, there's no intrinsic need for them all to remain together. But here they are collectively thrust into a new problem, presumably by Q, or Q's just there for sport. I wonder if this could herald the return of characters we've already lost as well. Maybe maybe Hugh, yep. maybe Narek, who's not been turned by the Jacques Vash. I think right. there's loads of potential here to re-explore all the characters we thought we already knew from Series 1 and look at them all again. And then, of course, to see Q again, to have him come back, this is perfect because he was there as Picard's you know, foil from Episode 1. It's fitting that towards the end of Picard's career and his life, Q should come back again to test him again. And we should get the the resolve of their relationship, whatever that is, whatever that's going to be. And I, I am actually very excited to see where they could take this and what this could really mean for Picard, what this could really mean for Star Trek and, and humanity even. What are they going to do between Picard and Q? What, what is it when a man meets a, a virtual god and they become friends how interesting could that be yeah it's so fascinating i mean in the same way that all the new prodigy information asks 10 more questions than it solves like this direction for picard season two to my mind having watched the first season finale a year and three months ago if i went back in time and asked myself what do you think season two is going to be about like this would have been the furthest thing from where i was going right like Mm. they seem to be on a path towards more of an exploration of artificial life and the romulan supernova and commodore o and you know sort of continuing a lot of those themes and ideas but either they decided they didn't want to do that or there's some kind of broader tie into that of what we're seeing but this is sort of very different from what I was expecting in a great way I mean I I, I, this is really really intriguing I loved seeing Q again fascinating he was sort of wearing some kind of uniform almost I mean you know who knows what it was you only just got a really quick flash of him I mean he dresses up all the way through there doesn't he he's a a big dresser up yes he is and I I wonder if this is going to because he had that it was the ornate badge he had on as well it's a razor unusual black badge he's wearing I'm sure that must refer to something that we're going to see in the episode or the series I don't think he's not the kind of guy who just comes up with his own clothes, although apart from his iconic judge's robes, obviously. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Usually he's wearing a, a rip off of somebody else's clothes. Yeah, I mean it just sort of has a very like time cop kind of vibe to it. And clearly mm. you're seeing a lot of alternate timelines within the trailer, right? I mean, they they there's that big pause on Seven of Nine wakes up and she's surprised to discover she's not got any Borg implants and, and we can see she's wearing a wedding ring, right? Clearly something's going on there. Picard yeah. appearing in that Starfleet uniform, the Admiral's uniform, which is the sort of Romulan supernova era uniform that we got a quick glimpse of in Picard season one, but 
but with the 2399 era com badge and pips. So sort of a mm. mashup of those two uniforms. What's going on there? Is Picard back in Starfleet in the prime timeline? Is this an alternate timeline where he never left Starfleet? You know, it just, yeah. the questions and the questions, but it was Jordan Hoffman who kind of pointed out this thing that made me go, oh, interesting, which is, you know, it seems like there's a lot of like, hinky timeline stuff going on and who do you call when the timeline is hinky and you need to figure out you know which is the right timeline because she just sort of ornately intuits what it is it's our pal Guinan who we Mm -hmm. you know feel pretty confident that Whoopi Goldberg is going to be back this season so maybe that's the way that she interacts with this season as well and that makes so much sense and then pairing her with Q as well and maybe maybe getting a bit more info about what it is that went on between those two, you know, in the dim and distant past, it would be perfect. And actually, it's it does pull together some of the very best bits of TNG, of Tapestry, of Q Who. There's a lot that could, that could really work. And we know it has worked. And it would be nice to see it done again and for them to reflect on, we've moved on, we've changed, but I'm still, I'm still dealing with the same strange problems that i had that i had back in the uh the 22 the 2380s 20, 2380s is that when the enterprise uh, next generation was set 2360s 2360s well i'm actually surprised i got the right century i usually always, always, <laughs> always mess that up i do think getting guy back is a stroke of genius and it was it's it's clever for the story but it's also fantastic just for the franchise just uh for when patrick stewart went on to that television show that uh Whoopi goldberg presents and invited her back that's just a gorgeous bit of real life isn't it yeah absolutely that, that was that was just so nice and then just, then hopefully it will play out yeah i would be very excited to see that yeah i mean that's the hope it's you know it's it, it was mentioned in that variety interview with Whoopi goldberg that she was doing it but we've not heard her be like i have been filming star trek picard so until i think i hear that i'm a little like just keep my fingers crossed and hope it happens it's got to happen surely you can't invite someone on like that and then not make it happen it's got to happen oh god you'd hope not <laughs> Well, switching gears from Star Trek that will be to Star Trek that could have been, in an interview with Deadline, director, writer and producer Noah Hawley, who had been tapped to helm a version of the next Star Trek movie before it was scrapped last year, revealed actually how far along he was with that movie before it was ditched by Paramount. Quote, we were on the runway. There was major casting that we were in the middle of. We had a production schedule and I was getting ready to go to Australia. And then, as you said, new management. I guess in retrospect, what surprised me is not that Emma Watts came in and said, are you people crazy? This is an untested crew. This is an original idea. We don't know if this is going to work or not. It's that I got as far as I did under former head of Paramount Motion Picture Group, Wick Godfrey, and Paramount President, Jim Giannopoulos. It was a really fun movie, and I think it would have been a great film. But you can't control these things, so we move on. While Hawley's comments don't go into more detail about the plot of the movie, earlier reporting indicated it had to do with some kind of galaxy-wide disease, and maybe given COVID, that contributed to the project getting scrapped. But the very interesting thing about his comments is the confirmation that it would have featured a new crew and not familiar Star Trek faces. Ross, are you disappointed we won't see Noah Hawley's Star Trek movie? I am disappointed. I, I'm one of those guys... I remember when Quentin Tarantino was touted as a, as a potential director... And, you know, lots of lots of like, mm, maybe, maybe it'd work, maybe it wouldn't. I like the idea of giving the Star Trek franchise to lots of different creative people and seeing their stamp on it and seeing what they do with it. And for him to have a new idea and a new crew and a new starship and a new storyline, I think that would have been really, really interesting. And it's not to say, it's not that it would have undone all the Star Trek we've enjoyed or that it would have impacted the next project that would have been made or the next series, but it could have been a standalone film that did its own thing. And to hear that it was shut down, perhaps in essence, because it was an original untried idea, seems a little disappointing. I really think Star Trek could be opened to all sorts of different directors, genres, writers, and some, I mean, DC and Marvel, they seem to have a really easy time at the moment, churning out all manner of different content, but keeping it all connected, making sure there's these thematic or character or story links, and creating a huge universe, comedy, tragedy, drama, but keeping it all in the same umbrella with the same themes. I think Star Trek could do that. And I think it, just because something is new or has new characters, 
doesn't mean that we couldn't really enjoy it. Yeah, this was disheartening for me. Not because I am passing judgment or comment on whether Noah Hawley's particular Star Trek movie would have been any good or not, but I am a little disheartened by the sense coming out of this. Well, I mean, Noah Hawley basically comes out and says it, right? Part of the reason his movie ultimately get, got scrapped by Emma Watts, the new head of Paramount Pictures sort of movie content is because it was that original idea and it was not kind of a familiar set of characters that forms a drawer of its own for the audience. Because that says to me that if this original project was not able to move forward, then maybe no other original projects that don't have sort of your big franchise regulars like a Kirk, Spock, McCoy, like a Picard, Data, that's it, etc. Like none of those can move forward either. You're exactly right. To, to think that every film from now on has to have one of those five characters in it because that's the, the name that people already know does seem to sort of limit the franchise a little bit. And we do have new characters always being developed and new shows are always being developed. And sometimes there's a seed of that new show in a previous show or a seed of a character that moves across. And that's great and that can create a connection. But actually Star Trek is a big enough brand in its own right and a big enough idea that even the Delta and the name that should be enough to say, well, if, if, you're, if you're a Star Trek fan, if you know what science fiction is and you enjoy these kind of stories, then this is going to be something for you. It doesn't necessarily have to have uh, Mr. Spock in it for it right. to be really good Star Trek. And if, oh, what's the guy's name? Like, Kerry Car- Car- Cluggage, or whoever the head of Paramount TV was in 1985 had been as myopic about a return to Star Trek and making a new star trek television show at that point in time we never would have gotten the next generation which means we never would have gotten deep space nine which means we never would have gotten voyager which means etc 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 right now we'd we'd have got star trek phase two that's as far as they'd have gotten we'd have never gotten further than that right and it just would have been kirk swack mccoy kirk swack mccoy recast kirk swack mccoy kirk swack mccoy and we wouldn't have gotten any of the you know jean-luc picard became an icon of a character so much so that in his 80s they brought back patrick stewart to play the character again and that never would have happened if the studio executive had not rolled the dice on actually let's not do Kirk, Spock and McCoy let's do something within the same universe that has many of the same concepts but is its own original idea so I mean ultimately this is Noah Hawley's position right for all we know there are a whole other bucket of reasons why the movie didn't go ahead that have nothing to do with whether it was an original crew or not and that's what he's choosing to oh yeah the thing that pushed him up i mean but... i can get behind the idea of it if it is about a galactic disease and they're thinking maybe this isn't the right moment for us to be producing a multi-million dollar film about a huge disease yeah I, I, that that i find it entirely more understandable as a you know what this just isn't the time for this now yeah. so let's let's pack this up and retool it or do something else but i am quite gutted about the idea that if he says he's on the runway that means there's designs there's schematics mm-hmm. there's characters character profiles there's potential casting decisions there's so much information here that you know little bits of gold that would be interesting to find out about where, where was this where was this set what was the ship called Right. Who were the characters? What what have we missed out on? And I, I wonder if one day this will become available to us. Here's hoping. I mean, I'd love to mm. see more about, you know, and I feel like they eventually do, right? There have been a lot of failed projects that we tend to have found out, you know, more about them as yeah, part yeah. of it. But So fingers crossed. Well, and lastly this week, the Star Trek Advent calendar that I mentioned a couple of weeks ago has been formally unveiled by Hero Collector. The calendar, which is shaped like a Borg cube, will include a new collectible each day for the Christmas 2021 season, including a coaster set designed to match the console screens for the original Star Trek, a pair of Enterprise D socks, and an espresso mug commemorating Zephram Cochrane's first warp flight in 2063. The advent calendar is now up for pre-order in the UK and the US. US Eagle Moss stores. In the US, it's $139.95. In the UK, I think it's like £109. Russ, do you think you'll be picking this one up? As soon as this was announced, I was all over this. I'm a, a, I'm a big fancy advent calendar guy. I, I am one of those guys who buys a big Lego calendar every year. And then now I've got kids, they get a calendar as well. So it's essentially three calendars for me. So I am <laughs> all I am all over this. 
And as soon as it was officially released, I was straight there on the Eagle Moss website in the basket. And then I saw what the price was. I was like, mm, now, now I'm going to have to put the brakes on and, and deliberate this for a little bit because it looks gorgeous. And the stuff inside, I know my house is going to be better for having Star Trek coasters and a Star Trek espresso mug and whatever other delights are in there. I know I'm going to love every single thing that's in there, but it's a lot of cash. I did go to the, the extent of telling my wife, listen, I'm going to buy a very expensive advent calendar. So don't go crazy when this comes up. <laughs> but I haven't I haven't pulled the plug on it yet just yet because it just seems like such a lot of money to spend and it's so frivolous, isn't it? It's uh, it's so frivolous to buy a, a fancy advent calendar. <laughs> ah, but it's frivolously awesome. I know, I know. Those socks look amazing. I, I know I want to drink coffee out of a tiny Starfleet espresso mug. I want that in my life. <laughs> I'm in for I, it. And every I'm time definitely. are you already getting that? Yeah. yeah. I've got it there in the basket and it, if it goes, if they sell out and I don't get one, I'm going to spend the entire run up to Christmas watching people on Twitter unwrap it every day. Including me. Going, I'm going to have had that. I'll specifically send you pictures every day of me enjoying <laughs> each day's collectible. So just know that. <laughs> You're a true friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there with my with Star Wars Lego thing going, oh, yeah, I've got a I've got a Link Skywalker. It's not, it's not Star Trek, but is it? Not, though? No, it's not Star Trek. And that is it, because I'm there for Star Trek more than any other franchise. All right. Well, we've talked about the facts. And now let's speculate on what's going to happen in the future of Star Trek. You make some very good points, Captain. But it's still all speculation and theory. So each week, I and my guest give you a wish or theory we're nurturing about any of the shows or the future of the franchise. So, Ross, let's hear your theory or wish for this week. Okay, so this is my theory. I was about 75% on this theory about two hours ago, and I'm probably now about 50% on this theory now. Go for it. In the Picard trailer, there's a woman who says time has been broken. Yes. Who is that? You tell me. Uh, so here, here, here's my opinion. I saw some people discussing this on Twitter, and I saw Terry Matalas sort of coyly chime in. It wasn't any of those names, but sort of, to me, hinted that it was a name we were going to know. And I've listened to that line now about 30 times, and I've, I've, I'm losing confidence in my ability to get this. But I think that might have been Denise Crosby. Oh, interesting. And I'm wondering if maybe we're going to get some sealer action, which might herald the idea of, like, the Romulan Senate and what happens if we're in a reality where Romulus didn't wasn't destroyed and then we have to sort of look at, well, how are we going to be doing things? If we're in a, where, if we're in a reality where Romulus isn't destroyed, maybe Picard then has to make the decision to go back to our reality, thus condemning Romulus to death again. And I thought maybe there was a there's a whole a whole avenue there. That's very interesting. And that is sort of in line with where my theory is going, which is I've been thinking a lot about the sort of timeline piece of it and the time travel piece of it. But to me, it feels like the show thematically to tie together should have a Romulan component to it. And so what if yeah. the story of the next two seasons ultimately ends up with they somehow fix the timeline so that the Romulan supernova never happens and you know the sort of more not bleaker but the well certainly bleaker for the Romulan empire future that materialized never ultimately happens which I, so I, I tested this theory out with someone and they said, well, wouldn't that mean the Kelvin timeline never happens? And I said, no, in the same way that when Spock went back in time and created the Kelvin timeline, the Kelvin timeline would continue as a separate timeline, even if the Romulan supernova itself was corrected. And of course, our characters would continue on in the knowledge of, you know, with all the knowledge of everything that had happened before, but now in this kind of new future. And, you know, Picard triumphantly, right, the, the big failure at the start of his life was, or not the start of his life, but at the start of Picard season one was, he was not able to rescue the Romulan people. And so is the big, mm. not redemptive arc, but is the big hero's arc of Picard he ultimately goes back and is able to correct his biggest mistake and save Romulus. That would be very, very interesting. And then he's in a, an unusual position of, I mean, I wonder if when we got Tashi Yar back originally, the episode name escapes me, but it was the... Uh, Yesterday's Enterprise. Where 
Yes, there's enterprise, of course. We were at war. We were a nation. We were in a state of war with the Klingons, and things were going very badly. And actually, the look of some of the Starfleet emblems—they looked rather militaristic. I yeah. thought, and I wonder if we're now in a, a darker timeline where perhaps the Romulan Empire still exists and we are at war with them. And so there's this awkward choice between: well, are we, are we entirely destroying them, or are we going to be at war with them, or is there a middle ground? I do think it makes absolute sense for Picard to still be dwelling on this and for the Romulans to still be a, a central focus. I do think Romulans need to be a central focus because they've created this... I mean, Picard Series 1 went above and beyond fleshing out Romulans in a way which we'd never really seen. And, of course, Laris, you know, Picard can't find Laris at the very beginning. Where's she gone? Well, she was there in the trailer. We did see her. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. And also, this, this brings me on to one other tiny theory that I've got, which is more of a... Uh, I thought it might be fun. We've now just seen someone travel through the Guardian of Forever to presumably travel through the, the different franchises, the different yeah. strands of the franchise to, to pop up here and there. Are we going to get a, a, a Philippa Giorgio cameo? In oh, any yeah, series? could do. We could get her in Picard. We could get her in Low Decks. We could get her in Prodigy. She could be anything. She could be the character of the character that brings the franchise together. Yeah. Because unlike 90 Star Trek, where all the series were stacked on top of each other, this franchise, every single series is set centuries or decades apart from each other. And the only crossover there could be would be some sort of time travel, a la the Nexus. Let's get the Nexus back in. <laughs> would you Would you want Picard's creepy Christmas family as well, or would you leave those on the drawing board? I mean, it depends. Is the Borg advent calendar there? Or is it, <laughs> is it just them? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy i mean there are so many different directions that could go in and that cue line around you know welcome my friend to the very end of the road not taken is so a it's a great line but b it's so evocative cute. yeah it's so deliciously yeah. cute it and it's so good. evocative and like as fans it throws up a bunch of different possibilities about what it could mean huh it's it's uh, it's just perfect. When he comes in, he looks so good, and they both look they both look great. But Q just looks immaculate. I am so excited to see what Q and Picard get up to in series two. So I am I am there for this. Do you have a theory or a wish for Discovery, Picard, Strange New Worlds, Lower Decks, or Prodigy that you'd like to share? Tweet them to me at Weekly Trek, or email them to me at Weekly Trek at the Tricorder Transmissions dot com, and I might feature your theory in a future episode. Well, that's all the time we've got for this episode of Weekly Trek. Thank you so much to my guest, Ross Webster, for joining me today. Ross, how can people contact you if they want to continue the conversation? I am always on Twitter talking about Star Trek at strtrk1701, or you can listen to Snap Trek, a podcast which compares two episodes of Star Trek for fun, at Snap Trek on Twitter as well. And you can find this show on Twitter at Weekly Trek and me at Alexander T. Perry. And if you enjoy the show please consider leaving us a five-star review on your podcast player of choice. And please check out some of the other great shows on the Tricorder Transmissions. And if you like our shows, please also consider becoming a Patreon of Tricorder, which you can find at patreon.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions. And lastly, if you're looking for Star Trek news on the internet, I hope you will turn to trekcore.com. Well, thank you, Ross. Thank you to all of my listeners. And until next week, live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs>